but so um, our impact lab, uh, this program, which is done in the Southwest. And then uh, um, my colleague, Dr. Laura Cardenas, she will uh, cover the air quality from egg culture. And uh, then our colleagues from NPL, they will uh, be discussing uh, the ruminant uh, animal respiration chambers, and they'll be doing some work on that space. Dr. Mark Coleman will be discussing that one. And then uh, key innovations uh, to control methane emissions. So we have got the industry partner here today, Francisco Norris from ZALP. He would be presenting that part. And then um, my colleague, Dr. Maria from Met Office, he would cover uh, data sets and uh, what they are available because today is hackathon. So this hackathon is primarily focusing on uh, how we could um, take the measurements, how we could um, uh, then look at mitigation, but it's all about taking the measurements producing the data and uh, devising um, some kind of um, solution around um, mitigation. So three, uh, three breakout uh, sessions we have today. And uh, one is uh, covering the soil emissions. Second one is uh, crop emissions. Third one is livestock emissions. So they will be facilitated by uh, experts. So Dr. Laura Cardenas would be looking after the soil emission from Rothamsted. Crop emissions would be looked after by Dr. Maria from Met Office. And livestock mission would be uh, facilitated by Andy Duncan from uh, NPL. And then we have, uh, because the time was short, so we just only have five minutes for people to come back here to the main room and, uh, and they, the facilitator would be supported by no takers and they would present uh, what they have discussed in those breakout sessions. And then at the end, uh, because this is, this is a online event. If you usually if you have a physical event, there's a chance to network with the people, but uh, in, uh, it's difficult to have on online. But I think we have organized today to have a networking at then so people could stay later on as well. So thank you. So I'll just go to the who is uh, here today. So I mentioned the name already. So uh, today's team is, uh, we are uh, six people here. I would say or eight people, I would say. <laughs> yes, eight people here. And uh, so breakout sessions, uh, three things we are covering. So soil emissions and crop emissions and livestock emissions. So, okay, May I just give you a quick overview of Rothamsted. Those who of you do not know Rothamsted, so we are we claim we are the oldest uh, innovation uh, institute in agri-tech sector. I would say so our history goes back to 1843. So we run that experiment that's still ongoing, and then uh, spark grass experiment, and then work on parathyroids and um, work on herbicides and uh, modern statistics. What we are talking about data science. So we have got uh, two campuses in the UK. So the main one is in Harpenden, second one is uh, in Northwick. Uh, that's where we have got uh, facilities like farm platform. But I won't go in more details here. So our science covers uh, from, I would say, from, uh, from uh, uh, molecules all the way to landscape. So from plant nutrition, plant health, soil, water, crop protection, and uh, computational sciences. So we run programs on a five-year basis. So um, we do a lot of work around net zero. So this is again our bread and butter for uh, Northwick Science and also over our Rothamsted. So a quick overview of uh, why Impact Lab and so why is this program is important. Uh, actually, we we're planning to have this event last year, but due to COVID, uh, we couldn't uh, go ahead. So now we have a chance to work through uh, online. So this Impact Lab program was established back in 2017. It's an ERDF funded program. That's the last, I would say, program from the EU we're we running here in the UK. So it's a it's program with environment futures and big data. It's led by Exeter University. And uh, we are seven partners, including Met Office, Rothamsted, University of Plymouth, PML, and uh, Plymouth College of Arts, and Exeter City Future. And the program supports uh, in areas around advanced engineering, marine, health, agri-tech, and environment sector. And we are, uh, I would say, we got funding until June 2020. So the next slide, so what do we offer in terms of sport? So I think I'll, I'll cover later on as well, but I think uh, Impact Lab provides businesses uh, support from 12 hours to R&D projects and uh, their small cash grants as well. So I'll just stop over here and let my, ne my next colleague to give us more details over to Dr. Laura Cardenas. Please share your screen. Thank you.
Okay, good morning. Um, I cannot get the PowerPoint. Can you see my slide? Yes, we, we, we can see, yes, please. It's no, it's not doing. Um, so it, it is showing up here for, for us. Can you see the... Um, yes, we can see. Okay. Um, okay, good morning. Um, and thanks for um, the opportunity to, to talk about this subject. Uh, so my name is Laura Cardenas and I am a scientist at Rotham State Research based in Devon. And I look at uh, gaseous emissions from agriculture. Um, okay, that's better. Um, so we are familiar with this uh, long-term trend of emissions of the main three greenhouse, gas, greenhouse gases, uh, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, uh, which have increased sharply in the last 100 years due to anthropogenic activities. Uh, they are produced directly, but also indirectly. So I quote here ammonia, uh, who, which is also a cloud precursor. So ammonia can cause uh, cooling. Uh, and also nitric oxide, which is a highly reactive nitrogen molecule, but is also involved in the formation of ozone in the troposphere. Then, uh, finally, nitrogen, which is not a pollutant, uh, is the major component of the atmosphere, uh, is inert. Uh, so from the point of view of climate change and air pollution is not an issue, but um, from the point of view of agriculture, it's, uh, it's a large loss of nitrogen for the system. If we look at the nutrient cycling in uh, agriculture, so as you can see here, we have nitrogen that is being input to soil from fertilizer, uh, either synthetic or organic fertilizer uh, from manures and, and digestates, etc. And this nitrogen uh, is uh, processed in soil into other forms, converted into other forms, including nitrate, which is leached to water courses, but also is evolved into the atmosphere as ammonia, nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, and nitrogen. And uh, also carbon uh, is released as methane and CO2. So, from the point of view of the nitrogen cycle, there is a, a simple concept to try to describe uh, the losses. Um, is the, the hole in the pipe uh, that assumes nitrogen goes in, some nitrogen goes out in, in product, and there are uh, losses in this pipe, um, the size of this, are represented by the size of the holes in the pipe. Um, from the inventory of greenhouse gases and an air quality point of view, there are uh, various sources which I have listed here. So for example, enteric fermentation produces methane, uh, but most of these uh, sources produce uh, nitrous oxide also, you have CO2 produced from urea application, from liming, uh, and nitrate leaching, as I mentioned. Uh, from the point of view of uh, air ammonia and NOx as, as air pollutants, they are also indirectly sources of N2O. Methodologies used to measure these uh, gases, so there are many of them. Here I show, for example, micromet technologies such as the decovariance um, that measure uh, emissions in a large scale. We have also chambers, either manual or automated, that, are, uh, me that measure emissions in, in a smaller scale. We have tunnels to measure ammonia. We can measure emissions from tanks, uh, storing manure, for example. And here I show a picture of uh, cows from a couple of years ago. We did measurements of methane, putting sensors on the cows. So we can measure directly uh, enteric methane uh, emissions. 
In terms of uh, estimating the, the flux and the emissions, I show here an example from a project funded by DEFRA uh, about five years ago, um, which shows for different locations in the UK how emissions of nitrous oxide increase when we increase the nitrogen fertilizer apply. It's, it's interesting to see also that the increase, although there is, a, there is an increase in emission with N rate, um, the, the fluxes are very different between locations. But also, if we estimate the emission factors for the same location, we can see that the emission factor increases for some uh, locations, but some others, um, emission factor doesn't actually change when you increase fertilizer. This is likely to be due to uh, high background emissions in the soils. Some of them will be uh, higher in organic matter, for example. So the actual background emissions are, are quite high relative to um, the emission caused by uh, management. At national level, emissions uh, from agriculture, so these are greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture, are about 9%. I show here for 2019, uh, the disaggregation of emissions per greenhouse gas. So here we have about 60% as methane and another 35% as, as N2O, and the rest is uh, CO2. If we split the nitrous oxide emissions um, further, the majority of the emissions are due to inorganic nitrogen applied or synthetic nitrogen but there are also significant emissions from organic nitrogen, from crop residues, from organic soils, and indirect emissions from nitrate leaching uh, and runoff. Further, if I consider the three gases, and I excluded nitrogen here, as I said, it's an inner gas, but if we consider ammonia as a pollutant and, the, uh, and, and NOx, and N2O as a greenhouse gas, we can see that ammonia dominates the emissions. So in 2019, over 80% of emissions were from ammonia. So this is, this is quite critical from the point of view of the nitrogen balance and the nitrogen use efficiency, because what it means is that most of the emissions go as ammonia, which is not a greenhouse gas, but indirectly can produce um, greenhouse gases. Another aspect that I wanted to highlight is um, the special disaggregation of, of emissions. This is also from the greenhouse gas inventory and using uh, models to simulate emissions at um, national level, but considering regional emissions. If we look in on the left hand side, the ammonia emissions are uh, higher uh, on the west side of the country and some of the east, on the east. And this is because um, it's dominated by uh, livestock and livestock activities. Um, in the case of nitrous oxide, it's more equally distributed. And this is because N2O is dominated by synthetic fertilizer. So there is obviously the dominance of arable crops on the east of the country and uh, livestock activity more towards the west. In the case of methane, there is a bias. So the, the emissions are higher on, on the west side because um, they are dominated by livestock. Now the NOx emissions, um, here we can see that the, the high emissions are in, in perhaps more urban areas. This map includes uh, also non-agricultural sources. So um, I have left uh, mitigation uh, strategies for the uh, breakout rooms, so I, I won't be showing those here. Uh, but I have included some uh, links to websites that, in, that um, are useful to uh, get hold of the data. Some of the data I have presented and some of the data I will show in the breakout room. 
So we have the archive where the greenhouse gas data from the DEFRA projects is included. Um, the farm platform portal, the Northwick farm platform, where we can download um, data from uh, from here, yeah, from Devon. The Environmental Information Data Center also um, contains data um, useful on, on emissions and the greenhouse gas inventory, which is uh, submitted to the UNFCCC on a yearly basis. Uh, we do this uh, at North Week um, and uh, contains the estimates of emissions uh, at national, but if, if somebody was interested in looking at regional, then we can look at, uh, at a slightly different website, which I can direct people to. And thank you very much. That's thank it. you so much, Laura. You saved us two minutes. Thank you. So without any further delay, I'll just move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Coleman from NPL. So he'll give us a bit of insight how to measure really the methane from cattle. Yes, over to you, Mark. Thank you. Um, I think you might have to put up my slides, Khalid, because the host has disabled me from sharing my screen. Sorry, Mark, if you just hang on a second, I will. Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I just encourage participants to uh, put some notes or any questions or any discussions in the in the in the chat box. Sorry, it's my timer. And also, please uh, uh, do uh, do a I would say any uh, tweet on the Twitter. Uh, we have got um, hashtag net zero farming. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. Yes, please, we can see, thank you. Great. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. I'm from the Emissions and Atmospheric Metrology Group at MPL, and in my group, we've got about 40 scientists. Um, I guess agriculture is something that is new, relatively new to us in that we've been doing this kind of work for about the last uh, eight years or so. And so what I've been asked to say a little bit about today is the calibration of ruminant animal respiration chambers. Um, now, I guess that um, probably some of the people on the call do know what respiration chambers are, but maybe some don't. So just for the benefit of those that don't, this is a quick sch schematic I drew up of how pretty much every respiration chamber operates, give or take. So within the chamber, um, you have your ruminant animal, and that's obviously a sealed system. You've got intake air coming in through some input duct and then air being taken out with the uh, emission through an extract ducting. This is normally where you position a flow meter in order to measure the flow. Also in the extract duct, normally there's a, a sample pipe, like a quarter inch pipe that is pumping gas out of there and taking it to the analyzer, which for methane is normally an NGIR type analyzer. So through the combination of the concentration measurement here and the flow measurement in your output ducting, um, you can get a, a grams per day figure for the ruminant animal that is under test. A typical facility would probably have one analyzer and something like four chambers. And so the analyzer is kind of spending maybe something like two minutes on per chamber and then switching to the next one and going around like that. But also importantly, would also be switching to making a background measurement because you of course, need to account for the background methane and ambient air that's coming into the chamber. Now, for a lot of people who are sort of involved in researching into ruminant animal emissions, they kind of refer to these kind of facilities as the gold standard for measuring ruminant animal emissions. And this, I think, is sort of partly because, you know, your animal is in a sealed system. So you really ought to be capturing um, all the emission coming from that animal. I think on some of Laura's slides, you probably noticed, um, you know, measuring animals obviously out in a grazing environment is a much more challenging measurement scene. And it's much more easy to kind of miss some of the emission that you're trying to measure. In terms of how these facilities are controlled, um, most operators would have some kind of in-house control in place, which is colloquially referred to as a gas recovery test. 
And what they're doing with this is they're replacing the animal with a cylinder of methane, opening that up and making a release. And so the facility is giving you a reading on how much methane it thinks you've released. By weighing that cylinder before and after, you can, of course, work out how much you have actually released and compare the two figures to get an idea of your chamber uh, capture efficiency. So that's what is happening on sort of a, a local level, uh, and people do a good job of that. But what it's always been quite difficult to do, of course, in this kind of subsector is kind of consider what is the comparability between different facilities. Because, of course, if you're doing, uh, I don't know, a set of experiments, if you're doing some kind of food additive um, for a herd of cattle and you want to understand how that changes the emissions, it's important that utility uh, you were using. And so that comparability is really important. And I think it's also becoming increasingly important to understand that as we're kind of in this uh, era now where scientific data is more readily questioned or even dismissed by people. Um, and so it's not enough, I think, in some ways to only report emissions data. It's important to be able to say something about, you know, what is the quality, what is the uncertainty of that data that's being reported and be able to, to make that kind of a statement. So one of the things that we have done, um, and this is actually under a DEFRA funded project, uh, we published the results in 2015, so sort of data was acquired for this about eight to nine years ago, was we went round uh, four, sorry, five uh, UK respiration chamber facilities and carried out releases of known amounts of methane in those facilities. And so we basically set ourselves up as a, as a transfer standard to carry out that into comparison. What we found going across those five facilities is a comparability or spread, if you will, of a touch over 25%. One of the things that you can do, having found that, which is obviously not, not an insignificant finding, was you can start to correct for that. And so this is kind of the classic kind of plot that metrologists often, like they often refer to. So what we have is we have a reference amount of methane that we're obviously releasing in each of the five facilities. And you have then that, that measurement on a given facility. And so this is just kind of representing a facility that has a positive bar. So overall is, is uh, a little bit over reading uh, its methane measurements. And so that's your bias. The facility of course has some precision or, or noise if you prefer. You can't of course calibrate out noise, but you can calibrate any kind of bias. And so we can provide uh, a correction function for that. And so that can be done fivefold. And so in effect, what you're then moving is those precision curves uh, from the five facilities all onto this reference point. So you're, you're removing your bias down to hopefully negligible levels. You're left with your precision. You then, of course, have to make allowance because when we release methane, in any given facility, we can't do that to zero uncertainty. It's, it's sort of more or less impossible to do anything to zero uncertainty. So we have our own uh, bias and precision. So you need to take that into account. So when you take into account the bias and precision on the reference release, and then the precisions across the five facilities, that's how you get to this number of a little over 2%. And so that's obviously quite a significant change you can make uh, through that um, that ring test and that calibration regime uh, uh, and, and that kind of then gives you an improved capability for determining emissions data uh, um, from that subsector, as I say, that community. On the back of that work, we're now doing um, the same thing, but kind of on a larger geographical scale in that we're now under a European project being funded to go around both UK and mainland Europe respiration facilities in order to carry out that exact same type of comparison. So it'd be very interesting to see obviously the kind of data that comes out of that uh, in due course. And I guess we'd probably be looking to put some anonymized data into the public domain uh, probably about two years from now. Um, last thing, just, just to note, uh, uh, this is an example of one of several letters that have been written by you know, key researchers in this field to editors of journals actually make, making this very case. And so this is, this is again following on from this work that we published in 2015. And they are imploring uh, the editors of journals to 
when they publish manuscripts from people that are acquiring data on respiration chamber type facilities, that those data should only be published if along with it, they publish results from their quality control, their gas recovery tests and any kind of quality control steps that they've taken. And so it's, it's very interesting to see how the community itself is kind of making that argument um, to move towards a more sound kind of metrological basis. So again, I think that's kind of a recognition that, you know, the way we combat scientific data being, you know, questioned or even dismissed is by actually saying we've done something to understand and measure the quality of the data that we have. Okay, so that was a quick flavour uh, of some of the work we've been doing. Um, so thanks for listening to me. Uh, back to you, Khalid. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been, been very helpful to sort of uh, look at from a measurement perspective. So our next speaker is uh, Francisco from um, is from uh, a company basically doing this work already. So over to you, Francisco, please. Perfect, thank you. Just giving us a bit of the industry perspective. Thank you. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see. <clears throat> Perfect. So my name is Francisco Norris. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm a founder and CEO of CELP, which stands for Zero Emissions Livestock Project. Uh, we're a company that is working to reduce the environmental impact of beef and their industries, focusing on methane emissions. I think by, by now the problem we're tackling is, is known to most on this call, um, but just brief uh, recap, 1.6 billion um, cattle in the world, uh, exhaling roughly 400, in some cases up to 600 liters of methane a day. Um, methane traps a lot more heat in our atmosphere than carbon dioxide, considered to be 85 times worse for global warming over 20 years. This, of course, is a, a major problem um, and a major challenge, um, not only for um, governments um, in, in, the, in the mission to achieve net zero, but also for beef and dairy companies that have pledged um, emission reductions in, in their supply chains. Um, one thing to keep in mind is also that the demand for beef and dairy products is expected to increase by 70% in the next 30 years, according to the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. So this means the problem is, is going to get a lot worse without radical solutions. Um, to address this global challenge, we have created at SELP a patent pending wearable device for cattle that works by neutralizing methane emissions as they are exhaled by the animal. And I say exhaled because 90 to 95% of the methane that the animals emit is emitted from the mouth and the nostrils of the animal. Um, we have a second uh, aspect of our technology that is really important as well, that is uh, a data gathering tool. Um, basically, we collect a lot of data on the animals wearing um, our device in order to um, increase welfare for the animals, optimize the productivity on the farms and generate um, greenhouse gas inventories, mainly because of the fact that um, when we target this methane, the first thing we do is we sense for the presence of methane uh, right by the source of emissions that is the nostrils of the animal. The way that technology works is by um, detecting, capturing and oxidizing methane emissions in real time. This process of oxidation is um, essentially turning methane into carbon dioxide and water vapor and strongly reducing the global warming potential of methane and the impact of, of methane on our planet. Um, for farmers, we are looking to increase margins for them uh, through the data gathering platform that we are bringing to farmers um, for free and through the sale of certified reduced emission beef and dairy products that can actually fetch premiums in retailers. There's uh, studies that we conducted in the UK and the US that shows that the willingness to pay extra for reduced emission products is between 15 and 20%, depending on the demographic and the type of product. For processors and food companies, we would offer um, strong emission reductions within their supply chain, which is something that for these processors is, is really important. Uh, we would do this in a, in a cost-effective uh, way. And we would offer companies uh, and processors the capacity to quantify methane um, 
in their supply chain. So basically helping them keep track of emission reduction goals in a way that um, up until this day is very hard for them to do. Um, for governments, um, the, the benefit is, is very similar. Um, we would help them create uh, methane inventories associated with the cattle population. Um, this is, is very important first to, to, to understand the scale of, of uh, uh, methane emissions in the agricultural sectors. I come from Argentina, which is a country that has a, a lot of, of cattle, as you can imagine, um, a lot more, more cows in Argentina than, than people. Um, so extremely important to, as a first step, understand um, how, how big this methane inventory associated with the animals is. In terms of the data that we collect, um, we collect data associated with the amount of methane that the animals produce. Uh, we are targeting to oxidize over 60% of this methane, which is uh, um, positioning us as uh, uh, one of the strongest uh, mitigation tools um, in the market, hopefully by the time we launch next year. Um, also the capacity, as I mentioned, to track emissions in the supply chains um, is something really important and to create inventories on a per farm or region or national inventories of, of methane production. Um, we collect data on efficiencies as well because um, we can pair the uh, methane readings with how much time the animals are spending eating, drinking or ruminating. And this paints a really clear picture of how effectively the animal is uh, converting the feed into milk or mass. Animals would waste between five and 15% of the energy from the feed in the process of methane creation. And it's really important to understand which are the animals that are wasting five and which are the animals that are wasting 15%, not only from a, a climate impact, but also from an efficiency perspective. Um, the third vertical that we are collecting data on is welfare um, because we track temperature, activity, uh, that is standing, walking, laying, methane emissions, um, time that the animal spends eating, drinking, and ruminating. We can correlate this hard data um, to find out early signs of disease, to find out heat, uh, but most importantly, to give farmers the tool to act on uh, particular conditions before they spread on the farm um, or, or uh, uh, cause them uh, impact on their yields or returns. The way um, we would deploy this uh, next year as we are expecting to launch it is we were working with processors and governments. Uh, we would offer the technology to them, certify emission reductions for them in their supply chain. Um, they would distribute the device to the farmers who in turn would give the processors uh, low emission produce. The farmer um, would have the, the possibility to um, access premium data if they choose to do that but they would always have a free version of um, our cattle tracking service that is available for them. Um, a final slide on um, the team that we have. We're a small team um, working um, across different uh, um, verticals in engineering, particularly mechanical engineering, software engineering, machine learning engineering, animal science, and um, chemical engineering. And we have partners, including ABP Foods, which is uh, the largest European beef processor, um, Cargill, Imperial College, and NPL, with whom we characterized our sensors directly and indirectly, um, because we, we did work at NPL with methane sensors, but we also use respiratory chambers as a benchmark for everything we do, not only to measure mitigation, but to correlate the sensors. Um, and I'm very, very sure those are calibrated by, by MPL. Um, thank you very much. Here are my, my details in case uh, questions arise, but happy to answer any questions on the line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco. It's uh, very helpful in terms of the, the step industry is taking and those measurements are uh, very helpful. Thank you much. Uh, please do ask questions here in the chat box because we don't have time to answer questions here, but uh, do uh, appreciate. Uh, giving your thoughts. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Maria from uh, Matt office. And uh, she's gonna give us insight with what data sets are available. And uh, because it's a hackathon is all about bringing data and uh, information together to play around to find solutions. Over to you, Dr. Maria. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you can see. 
Can you see the presentation? Is it? Yes, please. Yes, we can see. Is it okay? The size and everything. Okay. Y yes, that's fine. Hello, my name is Maria Tanasiadu, and um, I am the innovation manager, uh, Impact Lab and Met Office. And my background, if you like, is uh, in atmospheric science, and I have experience with air quality, greenhouse gases over the years, both measurements and transport, climate change and satellites with emphasis on plant diseases. Um, a previous speakers have uh, talked about emissions from um, livestock and agriculture. And I will concentrate on crops. I, in my original slides, I had other activities that I, in the farm and from agriculture that I had removed because um, they, I was told they are not considered part of the agriculture. But actually, after the uh, discussion in, um, in the chat, I thought we should consider them, especially for both for greenhouse gases and air quality. So the main thing um, here is to emphasize that crops uh, can be both emitters and uh, sinks of pollutants and greenhouse gases, and they're an important component for mitigation, climate change impacts, and contributing towards um, net zero. So another thing that I would like to emphasize is that to understand what data we need, we have to look at the whole picture. Air quality is affected by activities and emissions that are local, but also further afield, sometimes hundreds of kilometers away. This is the case both for our natural and anthropogenic um, emissions. And to address the challenges and find solutions, we need both measurements and models. And to understand transboundary contributions or transport of pollutions, we need weather data and also models to capture a chemical reactions. And finally, to evaluate, predict, mitigate, to adapt climate change, we need climate um, change predictions. Uh, why climate change, in my thinking, is uh, important because it changes the environment conditions. Crops are growing, uh, like temperature, humidity, rain, also shifting seasons and other things. They change the uh, um, changes that affect transport of the pollutants from one area to another and change the and affect chemical reactions. Also, uh, plant diseases and pests. Uh, new ones are introduced in climates that they couldn't survive before and things like that or travel more. And also, it's useful uh, to consider uh, when we consider adaptation mitigation strategies. Another thing is when to I try to understand observations, different, um, they measure both local and transported pollution and different instruments measure different things. For example, a sensor at the surface um, has um, a range of a few meters uh, and it's time of second and it's only surface, something measured from a satellite. It's over a big column over the whole of the atmosphere, kilometers, and it includes emissions from various sources and also affected by meteorology like clouds. So the representativeness of the data you're using is very important to consider. And also you need the models that account for transport, modification along the road, combined information of various sources. So when it comes to data and information, I have compiled and uh, a list of some, this is mostly for the UK, but not all, of information and data. Other sources of data, these are mostly sensors, so surface observations or models or reports. Um, the other important thing uh, of source of data, especially if you're interested in global, global coverage, is from satellites like Landsat that uh, can give information about the land surface and the vegetation, or sentinels that, um, like Sentinel-5 tropomy, that you can measure greenhouse gases and, um, <clears throat> and air quality with various degrees, some better, some uh, less. Finally, we have data from models, both weather, climate, and air quality, and this is a list. There are already databases from like six years, and it's ongoing with global and high resolution UK data at 10 and one kilometer respectively of many parameters. Uh, of many parameters. Also, we have for the last year and a half air quality 
and uh, gritty data from the Met Office IQ model. It's about two kilometer resolution. This sets a part of the COVID response we did, so it's freely available data. Also, we have other data that can be extracted if you need, like soil from um, the surface. We have observations with weather parameters, site specific. And finally, something which is very exciting, we have climate predictions at a very high resolution at 2.2 kilometers that are also available for research and collaboration. And I think this is from me. Thank you, I'll hand back to Kali. Thank you so much, Maria. That's very helpful in terms of our data sources are available for free and uh, open as well. And this is a Met Office has a fantastic uh, facilities and uh, infrastructure. So thank you very much. And I'll just uh, over to Andy Duncan from NPL. So what sort of funding are available out there uh, if we want to develop collaborations? So the whole idea of this uh, today's event is to let people to work together and uh, develop some ideas where we can work together in the region uh, with the, I would say, research facilities. Thank you. Yes, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, a quick introduction to MPL and a little bit about uh, grant opportunities and funding opportunities that might be useful to, to chase up some of the innovation uh, ideas. I work uh, as an account manager in the commercial team, um, particularly in the environment sector. So that's around air quality, emissions monitoring, climate net zero, uh, gas and particle metrology, for example. Um, MPL, National Physical Laboratories, is the UK's National Measurement Institute. We're government owned. We have about 800 scientists, 400 laboratories, and we're really here to support innovation UK businesses. And that particularly has impact for, for smaller companies. So we're addressing key national, international challenges around advanced manufacturing, digital energy and environment, health and life sciences. And the thing about that is agri-tech challenges can cover all of these themes. So if you have a look at MPL's structure, we're about nine, we're nine science departments, but 30 science groups. So we really have very, very broad expertise. So when we're engaging with companies like Zelpel, we can help them across gas metrology, uh, emissions, uh, we can help with mass and materials. So we can combine all of these techniques um, from the MPL groups as required, uh, which is a kind of special thing for MPL because of the breadth of our, of our science and technology. If you're looking at, at uh, emissions and atmospheric metrology, of course, you're thinking about measurements from the ground up. We, we get involved in satellite measurements, calibration of satellite instruments, and then all the way down to ground instruments and atmospheric uh, um, and instrumentation calibration. And what you'll find with, with problems, particularly when you look at innovation solutions, is uh, measurement, of course, is terribly important. You want to know what's the starting position? Where are we now? What are the emissions like now? Then if we do make improvements, how do we capture the improvements and do we trust the data that we're measuring? Um, now, one thing we have, which has been running really successfully since uh, Q3 of, of last calendar year, is a measurement for recovery. It was originally set up to help companies coming from and, re and recovering from COVID and Corona shutdown, but now is really just supporting companies um, across the board with measurement applications. So this is for UK limited companies. Um, it's a very, very simple process. So we have our own portal, a measurement for recovery portal on the NPL website. So if you search for NPL and M4R, and this link will work as well when we share the presentation, um, you can apply for a, a, a project which will be reviewed and approved and can start very quickly within a period of weeks. It comes from de minimis funding. So if you're a UK company, you'll have various grants. Some of that will count against your de minimis limit. Um, but it's very unusual for companies to have used up their de minimis limit. So it's 100% for free and it allows projects with 20 days support delivered over two months. And you can have even more than one project provided they're uh, on different topics. The M4R program is currently open. It's been running for several months now, but it is useful to get the applications in early. So potentially in April or, or early May as, as it will come to an end eventually. Um, we've had over 300 projects so far, approved so far, just to give you an idea, and about 180 of those have been delivered. And these are mostly with micro and small companies, actually. So don't be put off if, if, you, if you are a small company or if you have links with small companies, we'd, we'd be delighted to, to have applications uh, coming through in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, the other thing to look out for is we have a larger scheme that we run in, uh, in rounds. This is called analysis for innovators or A4I, 
Um, and this is for companies that, that have products that are in or close to market. And that's a question of making the most impact for the, for the support that we give you. These, these are much larger project schemes, could run up to even sort of 200 or 300,000 pounds equivalent. So not only then do they give you MPL time for free, they can actually be a source of funding for companies as well. We're hoping to have a, a new round of Safer Eye towards the end of this year, or early uh, 2022. So it's a little bit watch this space, it's to be confirmed, but hopefully we'll have a, a round of Safer Eyes coming up and they could be suitable for innovation development. The other thing I want to, to highlight is are the Innovate uh, KTN networks, they're extremely useful. So the knowledge transfer networks run by, by the government team are set by a series of uh, science disciplines. And as with the uh, MPL science disciplines, many of these things could be agri-tech, sensors, for example, electronics, agri-food, of course, you know, chemistry, health, etc. So although I've highlighted here a link for the agri-food with respect to climate change from the KTN, um, it's worth following uh, grant funding opportunities across all of these science sectors. Uh, the KTNs, in addition, run newsletters, regular newsletters and events. So I would say uh, if you visit the KTN website, subscribe to the newsletters. They're extremely useful. They collate a lot of useful information and they always have the latest grant funding opportunities on there as well. So they, they're extremely well done. <clears throat> the other opportunity is when you're working with, with, with universities, so industry and university collaborations through knowledge transfer partnerships, KTP, that's another form of support, can be very successful. So I've put the link on there. <clears throat> UKRI uh, and Innovate and Government Grant Schemes themselves, they have been updating the website recently, the UKRI.org website, hopefully is a little bit more user friendly, but that will also show um, a lot of the Innovate grant funding opportunities. Which, and many of those are gonna be shaped around net zero, sustainability, uh, environmental, and, and data and digital projects also will, will dominate. So there will be quite a few specific um, grant funding opportunities around those themes. One thing with the Innovate funding opportunities is Innovate have said that if you have a good idea, they are open to, to receiving that at any time you can apply for, for uh, funding for a good idea without waiting for a, a particular scheme to have come up so um, and if you have some ideas as well perhaps um, I can help you with that and uh, and point you in the right direction as I know some of the innovate uh, people and also sort of people helping with the university grant schemes so I've whizzed through that very quickly in the interest of time but very happy for you to contact me at any stage and we'll share those those details particularly if you've got ideas for M4R projects in the short term so that's all from me Thank you, Andy, for highlighting the funding available in the UK. So, excellent. Again, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, because uh, the program we run, uh, the Impact Lab, so they have got uh, funding as well. But the only limit is the companies have to have either interest in Devon or they're based in Devon. So please do get in touch with either me or Maria. So, But I think without further delay, we just move on to the next session, which is the, the key, uh, I would say, the crux of the day is uh, the breakout sessions. So um, I'm just going to ask here, um, uh, Emma, you have uh, posted all these links for uh, the breakout sessions, please. Would you mind showing them here? So we have got uh, four breakout sessions today. Uh, two, three, sorry, three. I'm sorry, my slip of tongue. So these are the three breakout rooms we have got here. So um, Emma is going to share here uh, the links. Emma? Uh, you should be able to see them. Can you see them? Okay, let me see. So are they are in the chat box. Yeah, if you go to breakout rooms, just down at the bottom, then you should be able to see them. So down at the bottom of your console. I can't see it in the chat. No, if you go to down at the bottom of your screen, Maria. Yeah. The breakout, breakout rooms. rooms there yeah. you go. Yes, please do explain. So how do we go there? If you just select join next to the one that you want to be in on the right, there's a button. Oh, okay, I'm going to join, yeah, thank you. So there's a button on the right side. So it's on the chat. Uh, there's a join breakout rooms, so on the right side. 
So we will be coming back here by 11.25, I think. Yes, so please, uh, and facilitators would be, Dr. Laura is uh, facilitating the soil emissions uh, breakout room with the help from um, Gavon and uh, from crop emissions, Dr. Maria from Met Office and for livestock emission again would be Andy together with Mark and uh, Francesco if he's still around there. So please go and have discussions there, come up with the ideas and uh, share your thoughts. And that's the place where you have a chance to say what ideas you have and how you'd like to see uh, collaborations going at. So I still see some people here, uh, around 10 people are left. So maybe please do let me know if you need any help in uh, finding a, a, this chat room. Uh, this finding the break, breakout room. So until now, it seems like the soil one is very favorite and the livestock is favorite as well. So <laughs> excellent. Uh, I see here, Tom and Tim, there you are still here. Tim, you want to join one of these breakout rooms? Uh, uh, yes, Carl, I can't, I can't find the, um, the join button. Sorry, I'm being stupid, I'm sure, but yeah. No, no, it's in the, it's, if you go in the chat box. So there sorry, should be, Carly. Yeah. yeah. So if you click on breakout rooms at the bottom of your screen in the black um, line, then it should pop up. There should be a little pop-up box with the breakout rooms listed. And then the join button is on the right of each um, room. Huh. Uh, shall I uh, share my screen? Screen, then you would be able to see the entire one. Uh, or Emma, you want to Just share? bear in mind that Khaled's view will be slightly different. So who am I speaking to? Uh, to, Tim. To, to, Tim, to, Tim. Tim. Tim Jones, sorry. Okay, guys. that's okay. Would you like I'm to sure be in missing. soil emissions, crop emissions? Yeah, soil, soil emissions would be great. Okay, Thank no you. problem at yep. all. That's fine. Sorry, guys. Yep. No problem. Uh, and then Tom is there. Julian is there. So maybe if you need, uh, you need help as well, maybe we can move you to that. Yeah. Yeah. So which one, Julian, you wanted to go with breakout room? Put everyone in, or put a few people in crop submissions if um, we have not Tom, Tom uh, which, which breakout room you wanted to, to join? Frederico as well? Uh, Zan? I'll put people in crop submissions. So it's on the right side in the bottom. Uh, you see breakout rooms is written there. Reactions next to the stopped recording button there. Right. So this session will be on uh, uh, Emma, meanwhile. Yes, yeah, I'm going to pause the recording and then I will start it again. Yes, I think um, and we, it, we had a, a conversation. We were mainly concentrating on, on the measurement side of things. So I can share my screen actually just to, just to okay, show Okay, so you are the first to go. Anyway, yeah, if I go, if I go first. Please. Um, it, it's not an awful lot of time in this, uh, to, to discuss everything, but we took... Um, some examples as well of of, um, of sensor and dashboard solution um, from Hannah. Uh, so one of the things we were looking at was around around the measurement of the emissions. How do you measure the emissions, and uh, what lo what low cost sensors might be available? So certainly MPL and other places we, we're looking at how do you incorporate low cost sensors? What should there should there be a, a kind of a, a, a protocol? For, for these and how should that be rolled out? Could that be rolled out nationally? Um, Hannah's got a project, a very interesting project with a, a college farm where they're using low cost sensors from a company called Lorawan to, to capture nitrogen type emissions, ammonia, nitrous oxides and the like, um, particularly from a, a chicken farm. And the, the very interesting aspect of that is they also ha they have a dashboard for reporting the emissions. So the farm farmer or the farm manager can actually see the emissions, uh, perhaps reported on a half hourly or, or, or um, something like four hourly basis. And they then can see the repercussions of various um, activities they're doing. So now they're very, they're actually engaged in the emissions, they're seeing what the emissions are, but they're also able to use that information then to change the way that they're working. So I think 
that having a, a kind of a dashboard, a way of uh, certainly sensors that you can rely upon, and then a dashboard that gives you live emissions data would be a fantastic way of, uh, of addressing the problem of reducing emissions, giving people the, the power and that, and that knowledge and information themselves. So we spoke also about, about how you might um, calibrate and test low cost sensors, certainly something that can be done and, and, and associated things such as dispersion modeling. Um, emission factors. Um, we, the farms themselves, whether they're not necessarily uh, have mandatory or statutory reporting locally, um, it could be possible that, that some of the larger businesses such as processors could be involved in, in, in rolling out affordable sensor systems. So the question is, is, is how do we capture the, the emissions that we're having now? And then we can use that information then to bring in mitigation steps and understand how effective they are. So really, we spent uh, most of the time in and around discussing sensors and local data reporting. But this example that Hannah had, had given was a, was a very a good one of how her sensor system in association with the dashboard could help a college farm. But the question is, can other people do this sort of thing? How would it be rolled out? Could we have government assistance to uh, perhaps to, to roll out these sorts of systems in an affordable way? Um, also helping people with things like if they've offset some of their emissions with vegetation growth, vegetable growth, I don't know, uh, rewilding some of the fields, how do you actually um, capture the offset? Is it, is it uh, appreciable or not? So um, farmers might be doing the right things, but it may be very difficult to know what sort of effect those things are having. So farm into comparison projects, also something we're looking about. Um, how the emissions for farm into comparison and, and all other measure, measure, measurement methods. So uh, the main mitigation step we looked at was from Hannah, actually. I don't know if anyone else who's in the room would like to add anything. I apologise if I've missed out some main things. Okay, thank you, Andy. I think we're just uh, running out of time. I'll just move on to the next. Uh, shall we... Um, go to Laura's team. Uh, is Gavan, you gonna present, please? Yeah. Uh, you are mute. You are still mute. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so we had a really very diverse discussion and covered an awful lot of ground in a very short period of time. It was quite impressive. So um, I can I can share my screen, I suppose. Um, Some quite rudimentary notes on here because I was actually taking notes by uh, on on my notepad. Um, so just as a kind of summary of the discussion, um, initially we uh, had an interesting uh, point made about the actual the the heavy machinery impacts on soil compaction, which is not um, and heavy machinery is not included in the agricultural greenhouse gas emissions directly from production. So that's a very interesting point. So it points the need for a whole systems um, approach when looking at, um, at emissions, but also in terms of looking at solutions that there's a obviously potential to explore methods to mitigate soil compaction from machinery, um, particularly looking at innovation around precision um, machinery that seems to be coming forward. So there's clearly a sort of research gap there that, that needs a lot of work. And then there was the issue of water quality and this uh, concept of pollution swapping, where one factor can be fa can be prioritised uh, over, over another. So there tends to be a kind of depending on sort of policy or um, fashion. Quite often, one one gas will be you know brought into focus. Like we'll be worried about methane, and then we may all be worried about um, about um, you know nitrous nitrous oxide. Um, so yeah, that's uh, also related to, I mean, they're all related. Again, heavy machinery is related to runoff as well. Um, but there's, again, it's a need for this whole, whole systems approach to, to be identifying you know, air quality, but also water quality where you know, um, nitrous, nitrous oxide can, can be um, coming as, as runoff, but it can also be coming um, gas um, and the need to kind of monitor that. And then we had a really interesting discussion about uh, aerosols and ammonia and the effects of small particles from urban intensive agriculture where over lockdown um, they've noticed that the the um, the uh, 
PM2.5 levels in, in our urban areas hasn't decreased. And that's very interesting because, you know, there's been a considerable decrease of use of transport um, and, um, you know, um, transport emissions have certainly dropped. So it, it looks like there may be um, influence from the continuing, um, not just urban intensive agriculture, but also probably national agriculture and um, the impact of, of, of other particulates, small particulates such as pollen and so on. Um, and then there was a, um, the, the issue of spatial and temporal flux um, in, in, and the, the need for continuous uh, measurement and also the challenge about how do we scale up from farm to a regional basis. So remote sensing is an interesting solution to explore in this, in this um, area to look at continuous measurement. For example, the use of NDVI as an indicator of greenness to locate areas of high urination. Um, and then uh, finally, we had a very good point about actually, um, we have to again look really whole systems in terms of looking to the supply chain. So actually there's a lot of greenhouse gas embodied in, um, it, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, embodied in the production of, um, of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. And again, that doesn't always necessarily get accounted at the point of use. And so it, it's, it's about not, you know, not being too siloed and, and this sort of whole systems approach seems to have come up time and time again. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was quite interesting uh, to see the soils, uh, their uh, emissions from crop, uh, from soil. And again, because we'll have the second uh, hackathon with that specifically uh, dealing on uh, soil emissions and uh, water emissions. So you mentioned nitrous oxide and nitrates, nitrates leaching into the, to the water. So uh, shall we move on to the third? Maria, your team is ready? Uh, yeah. Discussion I yeah. I don't have it in nice. Um... I partially feel the, uh, the, the thing, but there is a lot of overlap um, with the uh, other uh, groups. And um, one of is how do you measure emissions from crops? There was interest in particular about um, focus on potatoes, for example. And one of the solutions is, you know, methodology, but also sensors in the farm. So something that Andy has touched. And the general idea about not only emissions from agriculture, but capture, um, there are other activities like with potatoes, for example, you have a lot of waste or how can you, if you do something to mitigate that, should it count, would that count about reducing your, you know, achieving your net zero targets, for example. Also associated with transport or storage for a long time. How do you calculate these things in an informed way? And uh, so um, advice and things on that. And the other interesting thing was like um, information about weather uh, conditions 10 days ahead, for example and sensors to measure. So the solution would be ideally uh, to know the state of the plant and the needs of the plant and the soil and the weather ahead. So you know how much and if you even need to use fertilizer. So that this way, by being intelligent, smart farming, if you like, you can reduce your emissions from the plant. Again, sensors, chip sensors to measure the state of the plant and an app that combines that with weather information would be great. And we also touched on mitigation. So, for example, trees to offset plants and the trees don't even have to be in the same farm because, as we know, uh, pollutants are felt in the cities, for example, because of transport. Um, I think I've captured most of that. Did I miss anything, Sam, Anya, from the group? I think that was pretty much it, Maria. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. That's, that's quite interesting. And I think one of the things uh, when you mentioned, I, I didn't know that the potato has an issue with the emissions as well. I, I was aware of uh, emissions from rice. I know for specifically uh, their um, paddy, uh, I mean, with the methane emissions, but also afterwards, uh, there's a big, big, huge issue in, in uh, subcontinent uh, where they burn the crop, so which is the residues as well. So it's a transboundary issue in uh, places like India, Pakistan, and uh, sort of that whole region which grows rice. But it's very interesting. 
So because the, now the formal part of the hackathon is done, but I think it's open for people to have uh, chat, discussion, or it's just networking now. So once again, thank you very much, speakers, facilitators, and uh, the note takers for your time and also participants uh, sparing time. So, and I, I would say uh, this was a joint effort uh, together with uh, NPL and uh, Matt of us, Rothamstad and Impact Lab. I would like to say a big thank you to Emma who has helped uh, setting up everything. But now I'm, I'm convinced that uh, uh, this Zoom is better <laughs> to handle. So, so open, open for any comments or any discussions here. So thank you again. So we can stay. Just